the edges, a VAT cut on energy bills, potentially a, a freeze or a cut on um, you know, alcohol duties. That's not really going to be enough to uh, make this winter easier for people. The common speaker, Sir Lindsay Hoyle, has criticised the government, saying the number of pre-budget press briefings is unacceptable. But once again, this House will not be taken for granted. It is not right for everybody to be briefed. It's not more important to go on the news in the morning. It's more important to come here. Let's get this message across. These are the elected members that represent this United Kingdom. The Queen has carried out her first official engagement a week after her overnight stay in hospital. She appeared on screen via video link from Windsor Castle, where she's staying, during a virtual audience with the Ambassador from the Republic of Korea. A parliamentary committee has recommended that Conservative MP Owen Paterson should be suspended for 30 days. An investigation into Paterson's lobbying for two companies he was a consultant for revealed an egregious case of paid advocacy. The former cabinet minister denies the findings. The Independent Office for Police Conduct says the number of police officers they've probed for allegations of sexual misconduct has spiked over the last three years. Last year, they investigated 70 police staff accused of abusing their position for sexual purposes. In 2016, they investigated 10. Between April 2018 and March of this year, the IOPC proved the misconduct of 63 individuals, 38 of whom were either sacked or had resigned. The mother of the two murdered sisters, Bieber Henry and Nicole Smallman, has dismissed an apology from the Met Police. The force apologised to the family for their initial response to reports that the two girls were missing. The sisters were found dead in a North London park in June last year. Daniel Hussein will be sentenced for the double murder this week. Met Commissioner Cressida Dick says the force's handling of the case was below the standard it should have achieved. New research says women serving in the UK military are at considerable risk of emotional bullying, sexual harassment and physical assault. A study published in the Military Health Journal showed that younger female officers are most likely to be subject to those behaviours. The study says harassment of any kind leaves women at risk of post-traumatic stress disorder. A US judge has set a deadline for Prince Andrew to answer questions under oath in the civil sexual assault case against him. Both the Duke of York and his accuser, Virginia Guffrey, must complete written statements on this before the 14th of July. Prince Andrew denies the allegations made against him. Animal rights activists have scaled a government building, urging world leaders to invest in a plant-based future. A group of protesters from Animal Rebellion, they're an offshoot from Extinction Rebellion, climbed the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs at 6 o'clock this morning. Well, they say they plan to stay there indefinitely. James, on the side of the building, told GB News the government's priorities are wrong. The UK government is being a public nuisance by spending £1.5 billion of taxpayer money on subsidies for the meat and dairy industry. That's an industry that is ultimately killing the planet and killing billions of animals. In the meantime, it's spending £150 million, that's 10% of that, on planting trees and, all, and similarly on alternative proteins. So it goes to show like, the government's priorities in terms of propping up unsustainable and unprofitable industries over what's ultimately better for the public and the planet. Former Rangers manager Walter Smith has died aged 73. He led Rangers to 10 wins in top titles as well as to the UEFA Cup final in 2008. In his career, he also managed the Scottish national team and Everton. The club chairman, Douglas Park, said Walter will be sorely missed by all of us at Rangers. You're up to date here on GB News. I'll bring you the latest headlines at half past one. But now, on the money with Liam. And this is On The Money. In tomorrow's budget, Chancellor Rishi Sunak will confirm a higher minimum wage and also a pay rise for millions of public sector workers. But will higher pay just generate more inflation, the very cost of living rises that higher wages are meant to address in the first place? We'll also be going to the North East to visit Darlington, a proud town with a fine industrial heritage, in line, it seems, for some treasury largesse. And we'll also have our Daily Money Talks in-depth interview. Hi, I'm Jenny, founder of Rubies in the Rubble. At Rubies in the Rubble, we take food that would otherwise be wasted and turn it 
into delicious tasting condiments. Yep, hang on to your hats. We'll be meeting Jenny Costa, founder of one of the UK's leading anti-waste companies, Rubies in the Rubble. That's later in the show. And as ever, I want your questions, opinions, suggestions. What should On The Money be covering? What do you think of our debate today? Get in touch, GBviews at gbnews.uk or tweet at gbnews. We'll be reading out some of your emails later in the show, so stay with us. This is GB News. I'm Liam Halligan, and yes, you're on the money. Now, during the Conservative Party conference earlier this month, Boris Johnson said he wanted Britain to become a high-wage, high-skill, high-productivity economy. But it seems, according to what we know of tomorrow's budget, that higher wages can simply be imposed by legal diktats or conjured up by the state. Wage rises are only sustainable over the long term when firms increase turnover and become more profitable. If wage rises are really to stick, they need to reflect higher productivity. That's better working practices, improve machinery, enhance skills and efficiency more generally, as the Prime Minister said. Tomorrow, when he stands up in the House of Commons, Chancellor Rishi Sunak will confirm the national minimum wage will rise for workers aged 23 and above from £8.91 to £9.50 an hour. That's a 6.6% .6 increase. Rishi unveils a pay rise, screamed this morning's newspaper headlines, reflecting Treasury leaks that the 2.5 million or so UK workers on the minimum wage will be paid more from next April. But of course, it's businesses footing the bill for this mandatory pay increase. The same businesses that also face rising national insurance contributions, soaring energy bills, higher input prices given supply chain shortages, no respite in business rates and, from 2023, a big hike from 19 to 25% in corporation tax. Few would begrudge the low paid a bit more cash, certainly not me, but this is a tough time with many of the small and medium-sized firms that employ the majority of our workforce struggling to survive. We must hope this increasing burden on business doesn't cause too many closures. And while ordering firms to pay more, the Chancellor will tomorrow also confirm a pay rise for around 5 million public sector workers, including nurses, teachers and the armed forces. Over the last year, public sector wages outside the NHS and for the lowest paid have been frozen to protect jobs during the pandemic and avoid a growing gap between public and private sector pay. From next April, those state workers will get a pay rise, the extent of which will be decided by independent pay review bodies. Labour points out that for many, these pay increases, quotes, will be swallowed up by tax rises, welfare cuts and soaring household energy bills. And there's some truth in that. Yet when governments engineer multi-million worker wage increases, as is happening now, that can easily drive up inflation, meaning a higher cost of living for all. Already above 3%, inflation is officially forecast to reach 4% by year-end, twice the Bank of England's target. Upcoming across-the-board wage hikes will raise firms' costs directly via the minimum wage and indirectly via higher business taxes, which could push up inflation even more. And that's Rishi Sunak's wage conundrum and your on-the-money question today. Higher UK wages, will they just cause more inflation? Joining me for this debate today, as ever, people who really know their stuff, ready for an in-depth discussion. That's John Richards, Unison Assistant General Secretary. Delighted to have you with us, John. Also, we have James Townsend, an employment partner at Howard Kennedy Lawyers. And, of course, friend of the show, Justin Urquhart-Stewart, business commentator, co-founder of Regionally, joins me with his red braces in the studio. Let's go firstly to you, John. Unison is uh, the UK's biggest union, largely a public sector union. Of course, this is good news for public sector workers. How do you feel that Rishi Sunak has announced this today? Um, well, as ever with government, they always like to announce the good things up front, don't they? So we'll see what's actually in the budget 
uh, tomorrow and in the red book when we actually do the analysis. I mean, from our perspective, um, what we want to see is the government, the Treasury actually putting the money into the government departments to fully fund any pay rise, because the danger is that if you if the government don't put that money in and departments have to find the money themselves, then the only way they're going to find that is, out, is by cutting services or cutting jobs. And what we've already seen is uh, significant. We already have significant recruitment and retention problems in the public sector, 100,000 shortage of nurses in the social care sector, which is funded by our councils. You have, a, you know, there's an expectation there'll be 100,000 shortages there. And the TUC have just done a survey fairly recent that showed a fifth of public sector workers are actively looking for other employment. So not just talking about it, actively looking. So there are some severe recruitment and retention problems that the government need to address. So to a certain extent, you can understand uh, why, they're, why they are uh, taking this action. And to you, uh, James, I mean, you, you will, in your work, you, you get into the, the real nitty gritty of, of wage negotiations and contracting and so on, and that's very, very important work. What's your impression generally of how wages fared during the pandemic for the private and the public sector and the wage differentials between the fifth of the workforce or so that work for the state across the UK and the four-fifths of us who work for private companies? Yeah, well, I'd like to take you um, right back to where the debate started back in 1998, when it was the Labour government introduced the national minimum wage. <clears throat> and I think at that stage, we were paying around three pounds um, an hour, and it was decided that it was quite a modest level. Um, as years have gone on, obviously, the national um, uh, minimum wage has increased. Osborne brought in the term uh, national living wage in uh, about 2016. And we've heard from the Chancellor that he's increasing uh, that wage from £8.91 to £9.50. That's still at a reasonably low level. Um, for example, in London, it's still going to be difficult to recruit um, at that level in certain sectors. There are, however, sectors, start-up businesses, where it is necessary for there to be uh, lower wages paid. And that's going to have an impact on some of those uh, smaller businesses, undoubtedly. Um, of course, national minimum wage legislation does, of course, have... Um, exemptions. So volunteers aren't entitled to be paid uh, national minimum wage. Um, those that live with you as part of your family, so au pairs, that sort of person, they don't have an entitlement to national minimum wage. And it's only payable to those who are either workers or employees. So you do have a number of self-employed people who won't be entitled um, to the national minimum wage. But it's been very interesting to see the evolution of the legislation um, you know, from 1998 to where we are today. And we've been having this ongoing discussion as to whether or not it is a good thing. I think on the whole, business now recognises a place for the national minimum wage, so long as it's placed at the right level. Um, it's the National Living Foundation, I think, talk about £9.50 outside of London, but they're still putting it at a higher rate of £10.85 in London. Yes, it's worth filling in that detail, James. Thanks for mentioning those, those exemptions. It's also worth saying that the 891 to 950 is for the over 23s from 21 to 22 year olds the minimum wage will go up from 836 to 918 the treasury tells us and the apprentice rate which is much lower will increase from 4 pounds 30 to 4 pounds 81 it's worth mentioning those justin what what do you make of this i know you won't begrudge people on lower wages a bit more money but this is a big increase it's a, a 7% almost increase <coughs> in the minimum wage at in one hit at a time when businesses are under a lot of pressure with lots of other taxation, coupled with a public sector pay rise. We're talking about seven or eight million workers in yep. total who are going to get an across-the-board wage rise. And I think you're quite right. No one's going to progress from that. It's not going to feel like much of a pay rise with all the other costs coming through in terms of fuel and food and all those elements. Uh, so there's that issue. Something that does concern, we've talked about this before, the real worry of inflation is when you get embedded inflation. Not just the one-off item, oil's gone up by X, Y and Z, one-off price rises. Embedded inflation is normally then when you get that into the salary system and then you start seeing this then having a multiplier on it year on year. That takes us back to the 70s and that's really difficult to try and manage and we come back to the question of stagflation of an economy not doing so well with inflation in, in starting to embed itself in it. And that's what we've got to be really careful of. Of course, we want more pay rises. We want few people to feel better off. With, this pay, with these uh, costs coming through, it won't feel that brilliant. 
But this concern about the embedded part of it is the bit that worries me. John Richards, let's go back to you. You and I are old enough, with all respect, to remember the, 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 the 70s when... It, inflation expectations really get got embedded in and we were well into double digit inflation weren't we 10 15 even above 20% at one stage we can come on to that but the politics of this are interesting to me i was at the labor conference as i'm sure you were there were calls from some parts of the party for a 15 pound minimum wage and Keir Starmer and most of the front bench saw that off and said no we want to stay at a 10 pound minimum wage as labor party policy the tories have gone quite a way towards addressing that, haven't they, with 950? And this 950, what it, you know, that's, that's what it's going to be announced tomorrow. That doesn't depend on public money, does it? So that's what businesses, by law, will have to deliver. That's quite near what Labour wanted. Uh, it is, and, and it's interesting, as you say, that, that it's a Tory government who are doing this. It is in line with what they predicted, though. This is something they said... Uh, as part of, you know, over the last couple of years, it's been a stated uh, objective of theirs to pull, you know, their their um, their policy on this data. So it isn't anything new or unexpected in that thread. But I, I think, you know, as has just been said, the reality is, is we, we're seeing potential inflation up to 4% next year. Uh, so that's going to eat heavily into this whole process. And someone mentioned the difference between public and private sector. And I, I would note that in the last decade, that the public sector has suffered significant uh, erosion of its pay, wage, pay rate. So if you look at local government, for instance, there's been a, an overall a 25% real terms drop in wages in local government. So, you know, the, the public sector has been taking a significant hit over the years. It's not just the private sector where, uh, where, where, where wages have been under pressure. Well, I take that point's well made, John. Uh, I'd expect you to make it. On the other hand, public sector people have much better pension contributions, pension arrangements, more sick pay, more compassionate leave and so on than, than, the, than the private sector. Though I grant you there has been a fall in public sector wages in some sectors. Do you not worry, though, John, about inflation really punching through? Because you'll remember from the 70s, as, as I do that it really was that high inflation. It, it, it was, it's lower paid people who get hammered when there is inflation, not least because firms stop investing and that's when you start to get employment cranking up. No, absolutely. You know, absolutely. There, there's a potential about inflation, but inflation eats into wages. And the reality is if you don't fund wages at anywhere near... Uh, the level of inflation, then more and more people lose out. What we see from low paid workers is the majority of money they spend is reinvested in the economy. Uh, something like 60% immediately goes back into their local economy. They spend more directly on food. They spend more directly on um, on fuel. You know, they're, they're, they have a much letter, better reinvestment in the economy. It's where where wages are going up across the economy in other areas, I think, where you're gonna, you, it's going to have a worse impact. James, let me ask you briefly, just before the break, do you see more wage pressures coming through in the private sector as well? The proposals or the announcements that will be confirmed tomorrow we're discussing today impact around five, five and a half million public sector workers and around two to two and a half million private sector workers on the minimum wage. That's about a quarter of the workforce. Across the rest of the workforce, do you see wage bargaining pressures stirring? Do you see employees becoming more demanding to address these cost of living rises? We, we certainly saw a lot, especially during the pandemic. Um, private sector employers just couldn't employ people within factories. So there was market forces were already pushing uh, the national minimum wage up, if you like. So the fact of the Chancellor's announcement now, it's something really that I think he had to do. I don't think any of us believe that you could conceivably continue to employ people on lower wages, bearing in mind where we are with Brexit and everything like that. And also, you know, behind this, if employers aren't paying the national minimum wage, they can get themselves in a lot of hot water. Employees have individual rights that they can assert before an employment tribunal to bring claims of automatic unfair dismissal if they assert their right to be paid national minimum wage. If they're not then paid it, they will take their employers to an employment tribunal and be very costly. So our employers are complying with this, but to a large degree in the private sector, I think they're already paying these sorts of wages. 
James Townsend, employ lawyer, employment lawyer at Howard Kennedy, stay with us. We're going to carry on this discussion after the break with Justin Urquhart Stewart, our friend of the show and business commentator, and John Richards of Unison. You're watching On the Money with me, Liam Halligan. We will keep this dis discussion going with all three of our fabulous guests. And the email's already flooding in thick and fast, as we expected. We'll be reading out some of those. So stay with us. This is GB News, and you're on the money. Hello there. Autumn is very much with us across the UK. Often quite cloudy out there through the day today. Some wet weather to come across Scotland, but very mild for this time of year. Now that's all down to our air coming up from the southwest. You can see these warm yellows and oranges produced across the map means that it is going to be a pretty mild picture. We have got weather fronts up towards Scotland bringing some rain and some fairly tightly packed isobars which bring a strong wind as well. Let's take a look at the picture across Scotland. We've already had some quite heavy rain pushing its way through during this morning. A brief lull in that rain but then it turns heavier and more persistent for the Western Isles and Western Highland later on in the day. Strong and gusty winds, gusts of 50 miles an hour here. Elsewhere quite a lot of cloud across the country, a few bright or sunny breaks but very mild for this time of year, highs of 17 degrees Celsius. Through this evening then, that rain starts to edge its way a little bit further east and southwards, getting into Northern Ireland through the evening and then later in the night getting through into Northern England as well. To the south of it, it stays very mild. We'll have a few bits and pieces of drizzle across western hills. These are the temperatures we should be seeing by daytime in October, not the overnight temperatures with a keen breeze. As we go through Wednesday morning then, we've got this rain pushing its way in and persisting through much of the day. You can see it really doesn't move very quickly. So we have a rain warning in force. There is the risk of some flooding through Cumbria, southwest Scotland, some difficult travelling conditions as well. One or two showers to the west of Scotland, to the south of that rain band, another very mild day. Highs of 18 degrees Celsius, that's 64 in Fahrenheit with a keen southwesterly breeze. As we go through Wednesday evening, then we'll continue to see this rain just trickling a little bit further southwards into northwest Wales. It stays on the mild side, a few clear spells as we go into the overnight period. And then it turns more unsettled more widely across the country through Thursday and Friday. Strong winds, the risk of some heavy rain. And as we head into the weekend, temperatures sliding away. I'll see you later. Welcome back. You're on the money. We're talking about tomorrow's budget. What else? Chancellor Rishi Sunak will confirm a higher minimum wage and an end to the public sector pay freeze. Designed to address rising inflation and cost of living increases, could these pay hikes generate yet more inflation, causing living standards overall 
to fall. We still have with us a fabulous panel. John Richards, Unison Assistant General Secretary, James Townsend, Employment Partner at Howard Kennedy Solicitors and friend of the show, Justin Urquhart Stewart. Justin, let me come to you first. We were talking about the 70s. Um, the difference between when inflation, of course, went deeply into double digits, even above 20% at, at one stage, one of the key differences is that back then, about 50% of the UK workforce was unionised. The state was bigger than it was in terms of employment. Now we have about between 25 and 30% of the workforce unionised. What difference will that make? They're very different structure indeed. Yeah. The power of the unions then, whether you agree with it or not, was certainly extremely powerful and had a d direct effect. We saw the level of strikes and uh, the disruption that went on. That was a, a very difficult way to manage their way through. And that lasted over, what, 10 years, going right the way through from the days of Barbara Castle. Yeah. Um, and so this time it's completely different. But there are still going to be those pressures there. Yeah. And those pressures will be then coming from then smaller businesses saying, well, given this level of pay, minimum level, am I going to employ those people? I'm going to find other ways of doing things. I mean, the trade unions still are powerful. I mean, a lot of. Oh. I mean, we've got we're about to turn to Unison. You know, very the biggest union in the country, very um, prominent and important and influential among public sector workers. And then you've got among private sector workers, a lot of people, if they've got the skills that are, in, you know, short supply. Look at HGV drivers. Well, they can rid. They're not name their price, but they can certainly generate wage inflation. We discussed a few days ago about the opportunity that that well, the opportunities and problems that would occur if those there was a strike or a holdback in those HGV drivers. That could, in effect, create an economic lockdown without declaring a lockdown. Indeed, and, and that could be very dangerous for us. Let's turn back to uh, the Assistant General Secretary of, Un of Unison, John Richards. I mean, how do you think the situation compares, John, with the 70s? You, you'll remember it as I do. There, there, there was certainly disconsternation among some parts of the population that the unions were so powerful. But on the other hand, for some of their members, the unions did a fantastic job. How does then compare to now? Uh, you keep reminding me how old I am. Which is, uh, obviously, <laughs> only very I, only I was a very, I was I remember a, it too. <laughs> I was a very young, I was a very young man in the seventies. I can assure you. No, no, absolutely. No, I, I do understand it. But we're, you know, we're not in the, the same sector, the, the same situation. I would, uh, I, I may come from a different angle from, uh, you know, from Justin on this. I think that uh, the, the unions were trying to uh, manage a different situation in the 70s. We are where we are now. Um, and I think that, that I don't see that the built-in inflation the way we are. I mean, we, we are coming out of an extraordinarily, extraordinary period. You know, we've just come off the back of COVID. The economy is expanding rapidly. And for, for my, uh, for, for the people I represent, that, you know, they've, they've seen during this time an enormous effort they, they've had to put in uh, during which time their wages have been held down. So you can sort of see why there's a desire for people to do it. And you mentioned HGV drivers then. It's interesting that, that in the public sector, for instance, local government, we're starting to see a shortage amongst refuse workers because the drivers are now finding they can they can earn considerable amount more money working as HGV drivers. So, you know, the economy, the impact, whether there's a union out there or not, you know, you know, the economy will continue to have an impact on workers' wages and employment, when we, particularly uh, when we've got such a tight labour market. We're seeing bus drivers becoming HGV drivers. I've been talking to various local councils and bus companies that have been dealing with that. Let's turn to you, James Townsend. I wanted to ask you, just as we finish the discussion, we talk about a minimum wage. I've described it in this discussion as legally binding and mandatory. How often are companies prosecuted for not paying the minimum wage? Because if you talk to people who understand the twilight labour markets, often around the construction industry or, or other casual work, the minimum wage isn't always paid, is it? So the majority of claims that we see generally arise out of individuals who assert a statutory right. Uh, they will go to their employers typically and they'll say, look, uh, this is the minimum wage. I'm not being paid it. Uh, if an employer fails to then uh, rectify matters and or dismisses the individual, the individual will have recourse to an employment tribunal, which they will often take that case forward themselves, possibly with assistance from, from unions or the citizens' advice or, or, or solicitors. Um, in fact, the High Court has jurisdiction to hear national minimum wage claims in the same way that the tribunal does, but the tribunal is a much uh, sort of more claimant-friendly 
forum for individuals to bring their their claims forward. So uh, if an employer fails to pay national minimum wage, they can be named and shamed, they can be fined by the government, but typically we see individuals pursuing their rights before an employment tribunal. The difficulty at the moment... Is it a common occurrence, though, James? It's, you've outlined the principle beautifully, but is, does that happen very often? Well, a lot of individuals won't necessarily assert their rights. They'll, they'll just sort of take it and realise that, you know, they have no choice in the matter. Um, but it, it certainly is the case that these claims are brought forward. I don't have the statistics um, in front of me, but there will be thousands and thousands of these types of claims um, being pursued every year. Um, in fact, you know, employers can spend a lot of money defending against such claims because not only will the individual claim their back pay, they'll also claim that they've um, been treated to their detriment or automatically unfairly dismissed. And then unfair dismissal claims will typically follow. Um, so it can be a very expensive business for an employer if the employer doesn't get it right. Very interesting. I think that's a debate and a discussion and an investigation for another day. Gentlemen, thank you all. We've had James Townsend of Howard Kennedy, John Richards, of course, the Assistant General Secretary of the Unison Union and friend of the show, Justin urquhart Stewart. I'm grateful to all of you for the discussion today. You're watching On The Money with me, Liam Halligan. Coming up, we'll be, we'll be hearing from our North East reporter, Rachel Sweeney, about how a £3.4 million investment in Darlington may help transform the town. Plus, my much-loved Money Talk series. But first... It's the GB News headlines with Rosie Wright. Good afternoon, I'm Rosie Wright. Here are the latest headlines. Teachers, nurses and police are among the public sector workers in line for a pay rise next year. The Chancellor will announce the change for millions of workers in tomorrow's budget. It comes after Rishi Sunak had pressed pause on public sector pay increases, with the exception of the NHS and those earning less than £24,000 a year after heavy borrowing during the pandemic. Former Cabinet Minister Owen Paterson faces a 30-day ban from Parliament for breaking lobbying rules. It's after an investigation by the Parliamentary Committee on Standards into Paterson's lobbying for two companies he was a consultant for. The committee said they found an egregious case of paid advocacy. The former Cabinet Minister denies the findings. New research says women serving in the UK military are at considerable risk of emotional bullying, sexual harassment and physical assault. A study published in the Military Health Journal showed that younger female officers are most likely to be subject to these behaviours. The study said harassment of any kind leaves women at risk of post-traumatic stress disorder. The Queen has carried out her first official engagement a week after her overnight stay in hospital. She appeared on a video screen, video link from Windsor Castle, where she's in residence. It was a virtual audience with the ambassador from the Republic of Korea. I'll have more on the day's top stories at two o'clock. Liam will be back shortly after this break.
Welcome back. You're watching On The Money. Now, ahead of tomorrow's budget, people in Darlington are being told a £3.4 million investment will help transform their town, create new jobs, regenerate the high street and broadly level up the region. Darlington's the first council in the North East and one of the first councils across the UK to secure and receive funding from the government's Towns Fund, which aims to enhance town centres. Our North England reporter, our Queen of the North, Rachel Sweeney, has been looking at how this money will be used and whether it's enough to bring about genuine change. This is the heart of Darlington. It might need a little bit of TLC in places, but where doesn't? It's a successful market town. It has a solid community, loads of potential, and now investment from the government. It's hoped that this money will go towards long-term growth. And to talk to us more about that is project manager Chris Maines and councillor Jonathan Dalston. Chris, we're going to start with you. £1.37 million will go towards Skinnergate and the Yards. Now, for our viewers who don't know where that is or what it means, can you tell us a little bit about it and what will change? Yep, it's going to get in the yards as a conservation area, it's a heritage area in the town, it's a, it's a very important high street within the town. It's, uh, as you mentioned before, it needs a little bit tender love and care and that's what we're going to give it. So we've been doing some work in the yards already, it's with colourful doors and benches we've made a difference. Think York shambles but on a smaller scale. And uh, that's Darlington, that's what we're aiming for. Each has got its own creative strategy. We've got the strategy of Project Darling in the yards, and we're building a, a creative strategy for Skinner Gate, which is looking to develop Notting Hill in Darlington, is, is what we're aiming to do. So it's high ambition, and this is just the start. They're quite an interesting part of Darlington, aren't they, the yards? The, um, an interesting history. Yes, yes. It's high rows, obviously, what it, it, it says it is. It's high rows where there's grand houses, the yards sit behind High Row and sometimes I think they've got a less than salubrious past. I think, you know, it's, it's, it needs to be lifted up beyond that. But the buildings are there, it's 17th century and older in parts, so it's, it's got a good history. Yeah. Well, you're certainly well on the way. Now, Councillor, 1.47 million, a new facility at Darlington College. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? What will that mean to people here? Yeah, so we're really excited because we've been listening to businesses and now we're in a position to launch this really innovative T-Skills project. And what that's about is getting businesses to work with education providers to build packages that are going to be meaningful, so giving them the skills so they can actually come out with a qualification that's going to absolutely secure them a job and a career for the future. Important to invest in education, particularly in Darlington? Absolutely, you know, Darlington is about growth and, you know, we're getting loads of people coming to relocate. We've got the Treasury coming and that's going to give a confidence to people to come to the North East, come to Darlington to, to start, you know, setting up their business or relocating their business, so we need to be in a really strong position to have people with the the right skills to fill the jobs that people need. Um, and moving on to half a million pounds for Adults Skills Centre. What is a skills centre and who will benefit from that? Yeah, so we're really, really proud in Darlington because we've got, a, we've got some fantastic buildings. As part of the Towns Fund, we wanted to protect some of those buildings and one of the ways we've done it is to secure the Northern Echo building. It's been a long-standing building in, in, in our town for a long time. So what we've done is we've bought that and then we're going to turn it into a skills centre and that's about giving adults the skills, again, that they need to do the jobs that are coming in the future but not only just the skills in terms of technical skills it's about behavioral skills confidence mental health that type of skill and we're expecting more people to visit darlington is that why the train station is getting a little bit of a spruce yes not just because of that but we were, we're looking at darlington has got a, a strong history and it's the birthplace of the steam passenger railway celebrating 200 years of that in 2025 and what we're doing, we've got the modern station, which needs a spruce up, that's happening. And we've got the Head of Steam Museum, which has also got a project in line. We're looking towards that. So you've got the heritage looking towards the modern history of the railway. It is Darlington's proud history, I would say. Fantastic. And in terms of levelling up, is this enough money to do the job? It's never enough money to do the job. Um, this, it's an excellent start and we're really pleased with what we've got. And we're really pleased to, to be looking forward to getting more. There's a lot of work to do in Darlington, in the town centre, and up the gateways of Victoria Road in, in Northgate. There is a lot of deprivation and, and improvement that's required up there. I think this is the beginning, and what we're trying to do is do it fairly for the people of Darlington. So, more would do. 
Yeah. And Council will end on you. What do you love about Darlington and what do you hope for the future? I love its potential. I mean, there's never been a better time to come to Darlington, whether that's to live, whether it's to work or whether it's to relocate and set up a new business. Darlington is absolutely on the up. Everyone across the country is talking about Darlington and I think you can see why. There you go. Everybody across the country is talking about Darlington. Come and visit. We'll see you soon. There she is, Rachel Sweeney in Darlow. Now, before we move on, we've had loads of you getting in touch on the minimum wage increase and public sector pay rises. Marlena says, all public sectors need serious audits. There's always demand for more money, but the waste is not looked at. Working in education, it's frightening to see how much mismanaged spending there is. Well said. Peter says, it now looks like the pensioners' triple lock was stopped to give everyone else a pay rise. Debatable. Alex says, applying public sector wage increases across the board just increases pay inequality and causes inflation, and pay increases should go to those earning under the average UK wage. Keep your emails coming. Tell us what you want to be discussed on the show. On the money, it's your show too. But now it's time for my daily interview series. Here it is, Money Talks. Now, today's Money Talks guest is Jenny Costa, the founder of Rubies in the Rubble. Jenny started making her first batches of relishes from fruit and veg that was about to be thrown away in 2012. And she now works with farmers and food producers across the country. Rubies in the Rubble was among the very first movers in the anti-food waste space. And the firm's award-winning condiment range is now stocked across the country in leading supermarkets. Since launching, Rubies in the Rubble has saved over 100 tonnes of produce. Jenny, that's a lot of relish. <laughs> that's a lot of relish. I think, actually, we're almost at 400 tonnes at the moment. So oh, I'm out of date, we've, we've, as we've, ever. Uh, we've, um, yeah, it's, it's an exciting journey we've been on. How? Why? Where? When, how did it start? Um, uh, well, so... I, I graduated with a Master's in Maths. I went into the city. And... Yeah, I was going to say, you look like a mathematician. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone says that. Um, and then uh, after two years of being there, I just mm. kept on thinking, I'm sadly not passionate about finance. And, uh, you know, I wanted something I was passionate about. Yeah. And I was brought up on a farm. Yeah. I read an article in the newspaper about bin divers one night. Yeah. And it talked about people getting Around arrested. the back of supermarkets, food that's just out of date, goes in the waste bin. Yeah, yeah. and people locking them, people sort of trying to yeah. live off of it. And it got me thinking about the food supply chain. I mm. thought, you've got unpredictable weather on one side, mm. perishable food, unpredictable humans on the other side, and what happens when it doesn't add up? And in the middle of that, you walk into a supermarket, and there's, there's ample, beautiful displays. And the more I started researching about food waste, I started looking into it, and some of the basic facts that we're wasting a third of all food that we produce globally, um, which in the UK is around 9.5 million tonnes. And if you think that there's... 8.4 million people around in food poverty in the UK. It's, wow. um, you know, it's a tonne plus per person. But, um, but it was more the, the environmental side that really hit yeah. me, that agriculture is the single largest impact that we as humans have on our planet, from deforestation, water usage, but from the carbon footprint problem. Food waste alone, if it was a country, it'd be the third largest emitter after China and America. Wow. So food waste is, is, has got a huge carbon footprint to it. And if we're going to look at the future of our planet and look at um, the carbon foot, reducing our carbon footprint, we have to address food waste. And rather than setting this up as a charity, you thought, no, I'm going to set this up as a business. Because I, 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 I guess then a business has a sustainable future. It doesn't depend on other people. Yeah, I mean, I've, been, I've always been really passionate about businesses being a force for change, that we are a capitalist society. Businesses have a responsibility to transform our community, to look after our community and our environment. And I really believe that, and I think there's, if you're seeing it more and more, that humans and, and consumers, we want more from businesses, more than just a service. Mm. You want to buy into them, buy into what they believe in, and feel like with your purchase and the way you spend your pound is sort of vote for the future and, and how you want to live. So you're a bright person with a background in farming and finance and you had a big idea and lots of determination. How difficult was it at the beginning? Because back in 2012, this was not a commonly <laughs> held idea or belief, was it, uh, that we should be taking food that's headed for the dustbin and giving it away yeah. for somebody else to make money out of it? Yeah, it was a, it was a really hippie notion of food waste. I think people thought of bin divers, basically. Yeah. Um, and the more you looked into it and the more you realised that 
so much was being wasted on the farm and farm level in manufacturing stage as well. I started researching it really heavily. Um, and the big thing for me was, you know, with wasting a third of what we produce and knowing that we have plans to double our food supply to feed the expected nine mm. billion on mm. the planet, mm. you know, what are, what are we doing? So I wanted a product that I could raise awareness around this need to value food again, see it as something precious, but also as a way of teaming up with farmers and saying, I'll take, I'll create a market for that. I'll pay you for that produce. It should be utilized. Um, but I'm very aware that those tomatoes don't have the shelf life to go mm. through a supermarket, sit on a shelf, but we can turn it into, it was actually my mum's old recipes that we started with, wow. which is why I started with chutneys and relishes. Yeah. And just thought this is a traditional way of preserving. Let's turn these vegetables into something that adds shelf life, adds value. So we can see some of your products there. Yeah. You've got tomato. You can, um, you can try these after Ketchup. I'm, I'm not going to dig my finger into them on, on, on air, but uh, they look fantastic. You can, you can blind taste that against the nation's favour and see what you okay, think. OK, and what else have you got there? Um, we've got a range of mayonnaises. So this was our first uh, Garlic range. mayo. This is a chilli mayo. Which is wow. Fantastic. Um, and then I also brought you our pear and fig. Pear and fig. Which is a... Keeps you regular, missus, <laughs> as, they, as they say. You didn't think I was going to say that, did you? Uh, not everyone not. says that to you, do they? <laughs> um, but what... So how did it... You had this idea and you had your mum's relish recipes. Did you have to put your own money in? Did you have to buy a kind of relish maker? What does a relish maker look like? Have you got a yeah. warehouse? Um, I mean, how, how, do you, how do you turn this into food? How do you, how do you turn fruit that's a... Uh, hasn't got a shelf life according to the supermarkets into what's clearly a beautiful high quality product that you can sell well originally i started going along to wholesale fruit and veg markets at around four or five in the morning and then i'd cycle them home on my basket and wow. uh, and rucksack and i made just from my flat my flatmates hated me but just you literally started out on your kitchen table started out in the kitchen table wow. So I was selling in small um, small markets around London, anything that was cheaper or that I could get a slot on Saturday. And then so was, and then Borough Market gave me a, a slot, which was great. What did your mates in high finance think? Do they think you? Oh, they she's was, finally lost it. Yeah, I mean, the that idea... Jenny, we always knew she was a bit strange. <laughs> well, I was probably, probably was thought of as a bit... I was always yeah. the, like, the martyr of the, the photocopying machine and sending out lun leftover lunches and things. But... Um, yeah, I, I, they thought it was a bit crazy at yeah. the age of 25, saying... But a lot of people who start out in business, their friends think they're crazy at first, right? Yeah, I think you've got to, you've got to be seen Unless as Unless the idea sounds unreasonable, somebody would already have done it. Exa exactly. And I think especially starting making chutneys, they were like, that's something you do when you're <laughs> 70. <laughs> Um, but here we are today, almost 10 so years So obviously, later. You, you know, you're supplying to, to Waitrose, you're supplying to Morrison's. You've got a, a bit beyond hanging around Borough Market in central yeah. London with a basket on the front of your bike. Presumably, you have a sort of quite a major operation now. You employ quite yeah. a few people. Yeah, well, we've now... Um, so now we work direct with farmers across the UK. Uh, we have three different manufacturing sites, not of our own, with, with third party. Yeah. Um, we're, we're starting to work with Portugal as well, um, so looking at different sort of expanding out of the UK. But it's, um, it's been a really well-received... I think everyone that grows or is part of the food industry, when you know how much work and energy and value and you've got good food sitting there, you want to be involved. So it's been, it's been a good journey. I think it's fair to say, Jenny, read, reading up on you, you were really at, at the vanguard of convincing supermarkets that they should give away their, if you like, surplus food that's now completely a given isn't it that's now utterly normal behavior by the supermarkets and for them not to do it would be seen almost as immoral whereas less than 10 years ago it was seen as mad how has that changed it's been a, i think it's been a phenomenal change in i think it's efforts from from a government level from supermarkets from businesses i think actually having entrepreneurial businesses coming up and changing things but there was a big shift for us in 2014. Um, a report was sent out about food waste. Yeah. And Tesco's very bravely were one of the first supermarkets to stand up and say, we waste food. And I remember talking, we were talking to their sustainability team and at the time and we, we had an amazing um, ability to have a good audience because mm. we were the only people doing anything. And they said, we can either all pretend we don't waste, but food is perishable. And I can push it upstream and I can sort of say, farmers, I'm going to actually send it back to you if I don't sell it. Yeah, yeah. Or I can sort of buy one, get one free and chuck the waste into your household. 
So I think just um, they wanted to address the problem and just the, start by addressing problems just by measuring what, what the problem is. And the beauty of preserves, of course, and condiments, by their very nature, is you turn something that's perishable into something that has, you know, an almost infinite shelf life, yeah. right? Yeah, it's been... It's been um, it's, it's definitely the area that we will always stay in as rubies. We've looked into soups and things, but for us, part of the story is about the fact that we've preserved it and this has now got a two-year shelf life on it. And all, all that sort of, it can be completely natural, but we're taking a natural way of preserving something and extending. This is obviously a proven concept. You, you're obviously now a pioneer among what we call in business a space, a sort of subsector of uh, anti-food waste. How big can this get? Because in the end, won't the supermarkets think, hang about, we're cannibalising our own business here? I, won't I, it reach that point at some stage? I don't think a supermarket... Because we work direct with the farmers anyway. So if we ever got to the point which we're miles off at the moment um, of not having enough surplus to get our hands on, and I would love to get to that point where we've raised so much awareness that everyone values food, we're taking the whole harvest... Mm. Utilising things when they're in, in abundance. Yeah. If there's no surplus, there's no waste. Job done, right? Yeah, job done, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think as us, I mean, the reason I got into food waste was because I believe that our, we have a planet that can feed its people. Mm. And our food system is sadly out of balance and we need to do things in the most resourceful way. So I would simply start, you know, exploring. I want to be the body shop of, of um, food and, and making sure that things are done in the right way, the most resourceful way. So it'd be tackling the next big problem. Well, Jenny Costa, it's been very interesting to hear the story of rubies in the rubble. I should be pinching one of these off you and uh, ta ta tasting it. And uh, good luck. Thank you what very much. Interesting story. See, business comes in all shapes, forms and sizes here on The Money. You've been watching On The Money with me, Liam Halligan. Every weekday at one, I bring you your daily dose of economic, business and consumer news. Stay with me. Up next, I'll be joined by my partner in crime... Gloria De Piero, for it is she, our special budget build-up show. Thanks for joining me today. See you next time. This is GB News. I'm Liam Halligan, and that was On The Money. Hello there. Autumn is very much with us across the UK. Often quite cloudy out there through the day today. Some wet weather to come across Scotland, but very mild for this time of year. Now, that's all down to our air coming up from the southwest. You can see these warm yellows and oranges Produced across the map means that it is going to be a pretty mild picture. We have got weather fronts up towards Scotland bringing some rain and some fairly tightly packed isobars which bring a strong wind as well. Let's take a look at the picture across Scotland. We've already had some quite heavy rain pushing its way through during this morning. A brief lull in that rain but then it turns heavier and more persistent for the Western Isles and Western Highland later on in the day. Strong and gusty winds, gusts of 50 miles an hour here. Elsewhere, quite a lot of cloud across the country, a few bright or sunny breaks, but very mild for this time of year, highs of 17 degrees Celsius. Through this evening then, that rain starts to edge its way a little bit further east and southwards, getting into Northern Ireland through the evening and then later in the night getting through into Northern England as well. To the south of it, it stays very mild. We'll have a few bits and pieces of drizzle across western hills. These are the temperatures we should be seeing by daytime.